place of refuge for the reckless and the people bereft of any policy solutions. That's why a DA government, when it does nothing about crime, it says bring in the army. They don't explain why they collapse Bambanani, but they call us to bring in the army. And our people are saying, we don't want the army, we want Bambanani. Because policing must also be in our hands. And Kada Asma was prescient about that and warned against it. I just come from a conference at the Carter Center in Atlanta, Georgia, in the USA, when I got Comrade Nongweba's request to introduce Comrade Tito here. I said to them, it's Kada Asma's memorial, I must be leaving. Someone who knew Comrade Kada from the anti-apartheid movement said, Kada must be turning in his grave at what was happening in South Africa over the last 10 years. I said, maybe a slight turn, but maybe with a smile. Because the Constitution and the Bill of Rights of South Africa on, who, on which his fingerprints are fairly prominent, he should be satisfied that this constitutional order of which he was one of the authors has withstood the most terrible post-apartheid decade that our country has ever been visited with. The separation of powers where the judiciary has meant that the judges could be an oversight over our society and ring the alarm bells, as Zondo continues to do. He knew when he opposed the Protection of Information Bill that the media were critical to alerting a society that was in trouble. And again, his words and the constitutional provisions were found to be absolutely right because the media were able, whether we liked them or not, they were able to warn us that things were going wrong. And through that we found our courage to speak out and eventually the ANC came to the party. What we are saying to you, the 2019 election is not simply a general election, it is a fundamental referendum on the future of our country. You may have your preferences, I like this party or I like that party and I like their governance and I don't like their policies. But I want to say to you, President Cyril Ramaphosa needs us to win the referendum for him so that this country in 2019 decides finally we turn our back on a decade of corruption of nepotism and the implosion of our institutions and we choose rather to go forward. Whatever your policy preferences may be within that, let us first get onto a policy path of honesty and integrity so that then we can debate as ordinary citizens what is the best policy, but let's first get onto the path. And that is why this is not a contest between DA and ANC and EFF. It is about whether we want to strengthen the hand of those who want to heal, unite, and renew the African National Congress against those outside and inside who are obscure and are nostalgic for the days when they could plunder without accountability. That is what it is that we are asking you to do. And so, my comrades, in the same way that you sent your delegates to Nazareth to start the change, I want you to be the kind of infectious disease that goes across the Western Cape and that tells people that this is the choice in front of you. We cannot have you rest. We cannot have you be tired. We cannot have you be disillusioned. Because when you are tired and disillusioned, others will take the gap. That is what you are called upon to do. And so I am absolutely happy that speaking next to you is someone whose appointment alone before his speech has sent out a message of integrity, a message of honesty, a message that we are in steady hands again and a message that we are on the right path in our ability and our desire to heal and to unite and to renew. That is what Tito Mboweni means for us today. I think 
We can have our differences, but those are tactical differences we will have with him. The principled agreement we have with him is the need for honesty, the need for integrity as we go forward. That is what he will present to us. The strategic agreement we have with him is that there is no jobs unless we grow and there is no growth unless we create the environment for that growth to take place and there is no growth if there is no sharing of the wealth whether in the form of land reform whether in the form of SME development of black economic empowerment and all of those kind of things we can have those strategic discussions with him but those are not fundamental issues we simply need to be a player again for the sake of Africa and for the sake of South Africa and the world and so comrades I'm not a singer but there's only one song that we must be able to sing from this moment onwards until the election. And I invite you to sing it with me. Tina Sonke Kulendawo, Sovoteli ANC. Tina Sonke Kulendawo, ANC. Sovoteli ANC, Sovoteli ANC. Sovoteli ANC, Sovoteli ANC. <laughs> Thank you very much, Comrade uh, Ibi. Um, I had forgotten to acknowledge our branch member, first and foremost, before he's anything else as a member of the branch. Uh, Comrade um, Faiz Jacobs is sitting there in the corner at the back. Uh, he is our provincial secretary. Comrade Faiz, would you just like to greet the house? Away to Viva! Um, Comrade Faiz, a uh, very disciplined member of the branch, he comes to meetings, when he can't, he sends an apology. So we are very, um, very privileged in this branch that we have people serving in upper structures who take the branch very seriously. And in fact, when he doesn't, we actually call him and ask him why he doesn't attend branch meetings. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Comrade uh, Faiz. Um, there's also Comrade Nuran, who is in the NEC of the Youth League. Uh, she's seated here in front. Do you want to greet us, Comrade Nuran? Viva! Viva! Bro! Thank you very much, Comrade. Um, we are about to have... Um, he refuses to go by the name the minister. He says he's a retired governor of the Reserve Bank. He says he's not a minister of finance. He's the retired governor of the South African Reserve Bank. Comrades, can we welcome Comrade Tito with a very revolutionary song? Um, and for him to then take the podium. <laughs> Uh, 
has one uh, little problem uh, of a public address system. So those at the back, maybe you want to come a little bit closer because my voice is not as strong as uh, that of Comrade uh, Rasu. Uh, so maybe you want to come closer. Comrade Chairperson of the uh, Gabby Shapiro branch, uh, Deputy Chairperson of the branch and uh, all branch executive members, uh, the Comrade Moonly, uh, member of the National Executive Committee of the ANC, Comrade Rasul, uh, I like the passion and the, and the energy that's still there. We need that. Uh, Comrade Dagmo, I always confuse him with uh, Max Ozinski for some reason. <laughs> and uh, for some reason, but he's much more subdued than Max. So every time I see him, I remember how I nearly uh, killed Max Ozinski when we were doing military training in Angola. I had a mix misfire, and the bullet went through the, uh, the wall. Um, had he not gone to the toilet at the time of the misfire, <laughs> uh, it would have hit him. Um, but he is lived to tell the story. Uh, and those days, uh, if you happen to kill your comrade by mistake, whatever the case is, it was a case of court martial. Because we don't quite know the reason why you discharge that, that weapon. Uh, you've asked me today to reflect um, on whatever I might know about Kada Asma which is not quite a lot, actually. Uh, Kada Asmal was, as you have said, a larger-than-life figure. Very short in height, uh, but highly energetic and intellectual. Kada Asmal, I suppose, gained prominence when he was in Ireland, having been the major engine that drove the establishment and functioning of the anti-apartheid movement in Ireland, in Dublin in particular. And he, together with many other comrades, mobilized a cross-section of the Irish people into the anti-apartheid movement which in many ways culminated in the Irish people taking our struggle as their own. Um, they organized boycotts against South African goods in the shops. Um, they organized scholarships for South African students to study in Ireland. They mobilized uh, solidarity material for our comrades in the camps in Angola and also at Somafco, our school, the Solomon Mashlango Freedom College. And at the heart of that movement was none other than comrade Professor Kada Asma. 
as I said, very energetic, very, uh, oh yeah, there's something wrong about him, by the way. We normally don't say these things when people have passed on. He smoked too much. <coughs> <laughs> uh, he smoked too much. Uh, so, uh, young people, please <laughs> stay away from that example that he set of smoking too much. Stay away from it. Um, so it is within the context of the anti-apartheid movement that I got to know Kadaswa. In the late 80s, I was at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, in England, when he was in Dublin. Um, and I, too, was active in the anti-apartheid movement. And we did many things there, some of which uh, were on the borderline between legality and illegality. <laughs> For example, the creation of DLBs uh, through which we would communicate with activists here at home. Young people don't know the DLB is. It's a dead letter box. That is an address you create in London, for example, at King's Cross. You go and hire a, a post box there. You hire it and a, a, the key, two keys. One key will be sent to the activists here at home. The other key will be kept uh, with us in London. So the activists would leave South Africa, go to London. They knew which box to go to at King's Cross to go and collect messages. And they would leave other messages there. So we communicated from time to time without even having met. But through that key and that DLB, we would communicate. Oh, there were no cell phones those days. Uh, no Facebook, no Twitter. Uh, but we were better organized. How I wish that form of being better organized had translated into how we run local government. We have run it better. And for, for context, again, the time that Kada was leading the anti-apartheid movement in Ireland was a very difficult time for us. Uh, in the UK, the Conservative Party of Margaret Thatcher was at its height in government. The Conservative Party was very close friends with the apartheid regime. And they made our lives very, very difficult. They refused to impose sanctions against South Africa. They refused to impose financial sanctions. They refused to impose trade sanctions. It's an interesting story. So we campaigned, for example, for financial sanctions which the British government opposed. But eventually we were successful when certain British banks, for example, Barclays Bank, uh, withdrew Barclays Bank, Standard Bank, Standard Chartered Bank, they withdrew from South Africa. We were successful. By 1985, there was a debt standstill. And the South African uh, government had a huge amount of debt. Uh, you might recall Citibank also withdrew from South Africa and created a crisis in the financial system. As I say, I also campaigned for, for financial sanctions. So when in 1999, I was appointed to the South African Reserve Bank and found a huge mess there, uh, which was caused by the financial sanctions. I said, if somebody had told me in advance that I was going to be the governor, I would have been less enthusiastic in the imposition of those sanctions. Because then I had to rewind the progress. We had, for example, a net open foreign currency position of $25 billion. For the ordinary people, that means an overdraft of $25 billion, caused in part by financial sanctions. Now the ANC has to undo all that damage that they did. Um, 
Now, I was saying that the background of Father Asma's activism in the, in, the, in the UK was also the unresponsiveness of the Fatsha government and the way to push them and push them for, uh, for sanctions and for support. In the process, we managed to split the Conservative Party. That's what the ANC is good at, I suppose. We managed to, to split the Conservative Party into the right wing and the wet Tories. The so-called wet Tories were slightly in our favor. And some of them were quite prominent uh, members of the House of Lords, for example. At least we were able to make some progress and kind of participated effectively in that. And that's how I got to know about this troublesome ANC professor in Dublin. Karasmal threw himself, as I'm quite certain Trevor Manuel must have told you last year, he threw himself into a higher level of activism after 1990 when the ANC was unbanned and we returned home. Uh, became very active in the uh, grassroots structures, but also in particular in the constitutional committee of the ANC. And together with uh, uh, Comrade uh, Zola Square, Perul Maduna, uh, Bridget Mabandla, uh, they worked tirelessly to craft a vision of what a future constitution for South Africa should be like. The kind of constitution which will have at its core the respect for human rights a constitution which will make it impossible for wrong people to continue doing wrong things. A constitution which guaranteed us a strong and independent judiciary. And later, that strong and independent judiciary was going to prove to be the best thing that we had. We're all squabbles now, you know? When Unungeva is fighting with Ugiven, they take the ANC constitution to court for the judges to adjudicate. Uh, so there was a danger at some stage over the past nine years that the judiciary was being asked to do more than they're supposed to do. But it was that constitution crafted by, amongst others, these comrades I've mentioned, that led us to where we are fundamentally the respect for human rights, which the apartheid system did not respect. And for that, we thank uh, Comrade Garda and Comrade Zola Square and others, Comrade Pius Lange, Comrade Albi Sex, uh, and others. But I found Kada Asma to be extremely helpful when it came to policy debates at ANC conferences. You might recall that, uh, I don't know what Given is going to say about this, but you might recall that uh, in 1992 we went to Nazarek, which is becoming a famous ANC place, I suppose. Uh, we went to Nazarek to debate the policy options for a post apartheid in South Africa. And, we, and for the SASCO members in particular, you should read that document. We produced a document called Ready to Govern. You need to read that document again and again in the same way as you read the Bible every Sunday. It will give you a sense of the framework which leads ANC thinking on policy issues. Uh, needless to say that I edited it. <laughs> so, that even gives it more gravitas. Uh, <coughs> and in those policy debates, which eventually led to this document called Ready to Govern. Comrade Kara Asmal was an active participant. That helped some of us a lot uh, who were in the forefront of the drafting process of, of those documents. Kara Asmal, the cabinet minister, as I said, he had this bad habit of smoking but it was him and President Baker. <laughs> and 
F.W. de Klerk at the beginning, who were heavy smokers. Well, I didn't say that, did I? Um, <laughs> so, in those days, we had not demarcated the smoking areas, but they were not allowed to smoke in the cabinet room. So he would stand outside the door, uh, smoke, and then party, uh, keep listening this side, and you know, not a bad habit, <laughs> extremely bad habit. But what was said earlier by Comrade Rasul is correct. Again, at the tactical level, the young people should learn this. When there is a meeting with documentation, try and read as much as you can. But I know what Qatar did. He didn't read all the documents. He read a few and made notes and got detailed in those few. So you'll make four interventions. And every minister will say, oh, Qatar has read all the documents. <laughs> yeah, so, but, but actually, he hadn't. <laughs> I caught him out once. He hadn't read all of the documents. But he gave that impression of, we call him the master of all portfolios. But read documents. That's one thing that you do not go to a meeting which has advanced documents without reading the documents. You can as well not go to that meeting. Read. Don't just rely on Twitter. Read documents in the detail of it. And that's what Kata did. He read a lot. But also in cabinet, Kata Asmal was very creative in his portfolio. Comrade Rasul has mentioned this Kara Asma's approach to the water system management in the country and the working for water projects, which was the first really serious attempt at a public works program in post apartheid South Africa. And creating quite a number of jobs. Um, even I got to understand better about what is an alien plant and why it must be removed and so on. Um, there was one particular plant. He said, this is an Australian plant. I said, don't start a rugby fight here with the Australians uh, by removing their trees. But that created a, a new excitement and enthusiasm about what we can practically do in a situation where the government was all but bankrupt because of the excesses of the National Party government. And so we we'll remember Kada for uh, his, uh, his role um, in the government. And in society, uh, Kada wrote many letters to the editor when editors used to read letters that are written to them. Oops. Um, there's some guys from the media here, huh? I'm sure you do read the letters to the editor. <laughs> Sometimes they don't read the editors. They get surprised that some letter was published in their newspaper. When you ask them about it, they haven't read it. Uh, sometimes they okay very substantive articles to be published in their paper. <laughs> they haven't edited the paper. They get surprised when they see it on Sunday too. So, but he, he wrote many letters to the editor as a way of also influencing debate and discussion, which is what Comrade Rasul was saying, that he didn't bureaucratize politics, but he participated in making sure that politics remains dynamic and attractive to young people and all of us. And there's one expression that he likes to use, which is correct. And he, he used to quote uh, a former British Prime Minister, Disraeli, who said, there is nothing dishonorable about public service, but there are dishonorable people in public service. Public service on its own is not dishonorable, but you do find dishonorable people in public service. And that's what we partially went through over the past nine years. This, this, uh, this great public sector heist that we experience in the form of state capture. It's a heist, that thing. 
It's robbery. There's nothing else you can call it. It's a daylight robbery. It's a heist. So those who participated in that heist are dishonorable when they're in the public place. And I'm quite certain that uh, those who have worked with Kata Asma would not agree to these machinations of state capture. Let me conclude by uh, saying that uh, there was something very fatherly about Kata Asma. And he always thought myself and Trevor were sort of light tickets. You know, we were light tickets to him. And uh, <coughs> so he would occasionally do the thing that we don't do these days. He would just invite us for lunch. So come, let's have lunch. Uh, and he used the lunch as a political seminar which is what the older people here must do with respect to the young people. Invite them for lunch, particularly if they're students, they want to eat anyway. <laughs> so, so invite them for lunch as an opportunity for political discussions and debates. And that's what he did with uh, uh, myself, Trevor, Gerald Carolles, and a number of other comrades. I think he had a house somewhere around here where we'd go and uh, eat lots of food, but why is debating and him smoking in the process? Um, and that's how mentorship works. Mentorship, comrade uh, uh, you see, if you organize a, a, a seminar saying that this is a, a seminar to do mentorship for Sasko, they won't come. Eh? What's food? Is a food? Huh? No, not going there. But if he said, come, let's uh, hang around and have lunch together, they'll come. And once you're there, you have captured them. Uh, and then you can discuss as much as possible. And they will remember it. Not the one where they must come with notebooks and write things. They won't remember anything like that. So that's mentorship. Uh, I was in the, in the suit today before yesterday, and I... Uh, Somebody asked me about intergenerational uh, mentorship. I said, well, I don't know about that. What I know is that uh, I was called one day to President Tambo's office in Lusaka, and he said, look, I'm going to accept the freedom of the city of Puekwe on behalf of Nelson Mandela. I want you to go and draft the speech. Okay? So he, then he gave me some pointers. This is what you normally say say when you deliver a, a, a speech accepting the freedom of the city. This is what you normally say. These are the sorts of people you should expect to be there. Uh, the media, members of parliament, President Mugabe, da da da, and so on. Uh, so go and draft something so that I can go and deliver that speech. I said, okay. Went back to the office, spent the day doing a lot of research. And then about 5 p.m., I went to take a nap. I woke up at 8 o'clock, began to start now writing the speech. At 9 p.m., the president's security people arrived, and they said the president has uh, uh, said that we should come and collect the speech now so he can read it before he sleeps, and he can give you the corrections in the morning. So I said, I don't have the speech. I spent the day doing research. And I'm done with the research, and I'm only starting to write now. They said, no, 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 no. It doesn't work like that with President Tambo. He asks you to write a speech in the morning. By 9 p.m., it was ready. Lessons learned. So I, <coughs> you know, in the morning, I said, he's going to get it in the morning anyway. So in the morning, I submitted the speech, and by about 12 noon, he returned it. It was written all over the place. Written all over the place. I said, but 
this old man, he asked me to write a speech, and now he has basically written his speech on my on the paper. Anyway, so I ran to the computer, corrected everything, uh, made sure that by 9 p.m. he's ready. They, 9 p.m. They, they came to pick it up. Then, but I could see this speech is drifting away from what I wrote. So the next draft comes back. He has written all over the place again, even correcting himself in the process. <laughs> so uh, I duly complied, I corrected it. The final copy of the speech, I could not recognize one word I had written. So you take the first draft and the final draft, it's just chalk and cheese. But that's what you do with mentorship. He didn't say come to a seminar to learn how to write a speech. He gave me the task and in the process learned how to do it. And I think those sort of things Karas Mali as a teacher uh, would promote and this is what we must promote uh, amongst ourselves. So comrades, the final thing is uh, we are aware of the massive challenges that confront the African National Congress. From a government point of view, for example, I can't say a lot because next Wednesday I have to present this budget statement. But from a government point of view, government operates the budget, to operate on the basis of the revenue we collect through tax and then allocate to departments and provinces and municipalities. There is no other source of money in the government. Government doesn't own a printing press. It's tax that must be allocated. So this idea that we can always demand of government anything, government must produce the money from where? If people don't render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, there'll be nothing to spend. So I was joking with the head of uh, SARS to say, I need the, an iron rod that I must use to break other people's bones so I can extract tax from them, just like Caesar did. So comrades, as you look at uh, uh, what we can demand of our government, we should also be cognizant of how the system operates. And in a low economic growth environment, tax collection also goes down. So it means you can't continue pretending that you spend like you did when the growth rate was 4%. It's different. If you have a growth rate of something like maybe 0.8% for this year, you can't expect the tax collection to be higher. Where is it going to come from? So even in the manner in which we seek to think about what the government can do with its budget to influence change and transformation. We should bear that in mind. Comrade Monli won't like what I'm about to say, because he's going to say, but you're supposed to say this next week. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, strategically speaking, if we're better organized, we should be making sure that we do not have a situation where eight out of every 10 rand goes to salaries and wages in the public sector. Because if eight out of 10 rand goes to salaries in the public service, you're left with two rand for other services. To fix a hospital, a clinic, so they said, don't talk about this salary and wage bill because Kosat is going to get angry. I said, but I didn't say anything. All I said is, uh, mathematically, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> if eight out of every 10 rand you have goes to salaries, there, and then you still demand services, on the other hand, where is the money going to come from for services? And I think that's how we should think about this thing and be in a position to engage in robust conversations about what we need to do. And I think that's what Kada Asmal 
would have wanted to go. May the spirit of Kara Asman live longer. Thank you very much, Kobe. We have both the minister and deputy minister who happen to be NEC members um, here with us today. Um, so we will have um, Comrade Dito and Comrade Monty, Comrade Rasul and Comrade Cameron participating in our very short Q&A. I am going to note a few hands, excluding the media of course, um, and there mustn't think that I don't know their faces. I, <laughs> I can see where they're all seated. Um, Comrade Janela, I hadn't denoted hands yet, so you can put your hand down. Thank you. Um, Comrades, we are going to note five hands. Uh, hopefully we won't have more than five who um, have burning questions. Uh, the rule is if the previous speaker has covered you, you are allowed to say that I am covered. Um, if, you, if I sense that you are repeating a question or a comment, I'm going to cut you. Uh, because we must also be cognizant of the fact that the comrades here today are actually here because they are actually in Cape Town because they are preparing our mini budget while the MTPPS, which is um, uh, scheduled for next week Wednesday, so we can't keep them the whole night. I'm going to note hands starting from the bank coming to the front. We'll start with Comrade Senzeni, uh, then Comrade Twala at the back, uh, Comrade Nuran, you will be third. Uh, Comrade Dianella, no, are you no longer interested? Fourth. Um, comrade with the ANC cap, sorry, I don't know your name, you will be sixth. And the comrade in the Sasko t shirt will be number seven, in that order. We unfortunately do not have a mic, um, but I'm sure we'll be able to project. Comrade Senzeni? Thank you, Comrade Senzeni. Can the next speaker please just introduce themselves and if you can also just state who you are uh, addressing your question or comment to. Thank you.
Thank you, Comrade Fala, uh, Comrade Janela. Thank you, Comrade with the black cap.
Thank you, comrades. Um, and the last comrade there at the back. Can we cut some Kada? Can we round up? Can we round off the com the, the question, please? Thank you, Keda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Comrade Karasman would have paid for the dinner. <laughs> so, the one who invites you will, will pay for the dinner. <coughs> the, um, you, you have uh, raised a number of questions, which some of which I will, I will leave to my <coughs> colleagues here to, to handle. Uh, unfortunately, I need to go because we're in. The, in the tail end of finalizing the budget. And some poor souls are busy working hard 
in the office. So uh, I will inform the, whoever is the next Minister of Finance that if they get an invitation from the Gabi Shapiro branch this time of the year, they must decline it. <laughs> because it conflicts with the, yeah, for example, some, some of the things I said there, probably the President will say you sh should have reserved them for next, next week. So, uh, but thank you very much for your <coughs> interventions. Um, uh, the I mean, there's a vexed question about uh, employment creation. Um, it's a very difficult because uh, first of all, the public sector being the civil service the state-owned enterprises bloated. So there's no room there. In fact, to take an organization like ESCO, they probably need to lose about 30,000 jobs because the organization is bloated. And the salary bill is consuming so much, uh, not leaving much for infrastructure management and so on. <coughs> Really, the, the issue should be what kind of environment is required which gives confidence to economic agents to be active in the economy, i.e. Uh, businesses, big and small, um, the, the entrepreneurship that the comrade was talking about, that's where you create jobs. Um, now, the government, you can do public works programs, you can do all kinds of things. At the end of the day, it's the farmers, it's the mining companies, it's the manufacturing companies, it's the service sector companies, including restaurants, uh, <coughs> transport and logistics, um, and so on. That's where jobs are going to be created. Conceptually, we have a problem. I know Comrade Moli doesn't like me talking conceptually, he says I'm confusing him. But conceptually, we have a problem. Conceptually, we have a problem because most of our thinking processes have not gone beyond the 1980s. And yet, our society has been transformed quite fundamentally. But our thinking is still like uh, mining is still important. It's like uh, people talk industrialization, this and industrialization. The world has moved. We're into the Wi-Fi generation now. Things have changed. 1980s, there was no Wi-Fi. Nobody knew it. And the fact that there's this Wi-Fi, it says something about the penetration of technology in our societies. Not mining. Of course, Minister Matash, I'm sure, uh, will give you a lecture next year about the importance of mining. Fine. But he must also connect it with Wi-Fi. Um, so structurally, there's been a massive change. And the bulk of our population, for example, now resides in urban or peri-urban areas. So how you approach the issue of land <laughs> must respond to that fundamentally changed structure of society. It's not the 50s and the 60s. It's different. Some young people call farming difficult, dangerous, and dirty. They want Wi-Fi. They don't want to go pulling tractors around. But we must eat. Somebody must do the farming. So I, I, I indicate this to you to show that, to say that <coughs> today, mining and acquiring share of GDP is about 5%. Agriculture share of GDP is also about 5 plus minus 5%, and declining, by the way. 
declining because there's a large number of farms that we gave to our people which are not being productive. And there were productive farmers before, farms before, and but we are, we are solving, our job is to solve the problem because we are not an NGO or the government, so we must solve the problem. Manufacturing share is about 18 percent. The rest, which is over 60 percent, is the tertiary sector of the economy. Uh, banking and finance, legal services, medical services, uh, community services, government services, uh, wholesale trade, retail trade. That's the bulk of the contribution to the economy. But you can't have an economy where the productive sector is dead. So we have to continue focusing as well on the productive sector. So where is this growth co going to come from? Sure, it's going to come from agriculture again, no doubt about it. But our own mindset and approach to agriculture must change. You can't keep on every day waking up and shouting at the farmers and still expect them to produce food. Whenever the politicians get an opportunity to speak in public, they shout at these people. Who? They're going to start selling their land, not investing in the land, because you're going to take it anyway. So our own, we must adjust our own mindset in how we deal with these issues. Uh, I know Comrade Mondley would deal with expropriation of land without compensation. I'll leave that to him. But the, so uh, one of the things that we're going to say next week, I think, is that there are certain basic prerequisites to economic growth. Policy stability, policy certainty, uh, institutional strength and, and independence, uh, a strong judiciary, we know that, um, an independent and strong media, uh, which is critical but fair, and not gossiping. Like the Sunday Times has been involved in being part of a scheme to destroy some of our key institutions. Not that kind of media. Uh, and then a strategic human capital development strategy. Uh, and then finally, the technological penetration, desktops, um, uh, and other forms of technology, communication, cell phones, and so on. Those are key to, in today's world, in helping to drive uh, economic development and growth. Um, for example, by now, uh, what the Houting Department of Education is trying to do should probably have been done in all schools already. And don't just look at the government for funding. Build partnerships and relationships with the private sector and get the show moving. But because, of course, you have to install Wi-Fi at school. Uh, and the, uh, when you install Wi-Fi at school, actually, your kids will come more to school to use Wi-Fi. They'll come. I'm telling you. Uh, and you have to find a way of, of making education far more interesting and attractive to them. Then they will participate. You see the changes. So I suppose what I'm saying is that <coughs> with this structural change that has taken place in our economy and an education system which has not responded to the change structure of the society and the economy, we have, we have then structural unemployment who produce graduates who are not going to be absorbed in the economy. So instead, the people are going to end up in the uh, public works program. Then the issue of entrepreneurship comes in. That I know that there are some universities which have got uh, modules on entrepreneurship but you really can't teach entrepreneurship, really. You can't teach somebody to be, sit, sit in class and learn to be a businessman. No way. I'm sorry, uh, professors, but no. You, you just need to have the drive to be an entrepreneur. But when you've got that drive, 
the biggest problem you face in our country is access to funds. Access to finance is a big problem. And I suppose that's what uh, Comrade Mondi is trying to help us to unlock the issue of access to funding. I mean, he's the chairman of the PIC, so. And, and, and uh, I would encourage you to go and look for the book. I forget its author. It's called The Hidden Champions of the German Economy. I forget the author now. Uh, go and look out for that book and read it. Uh, when you're off Twitter, read it. Um, it tells the story of the German economy, which is principally dependent on the small and medium enterprises. Those are the drivers of the German economy. Sure, there's BMW, Mercedes-Benz, Siemens, and others, but the real drivers are the small and medium enterprises. And go and look out for that. Um, again, I'll leave Comrade Mondly with the, the issue of gear uh, to deal with. Uh, and, uh, no, no. No, no, he's going to learn a lesson that if you go with a minister to a meeting, he's going to delegate to you. <laughs> That's the consequences. Uh, but, uh, yes, you're correct that on the, was it the 15th of September 2008, uh, Lehman Brothers collapsed. And that became the the starting point of the financial crisis of 2008-2009. Um, at the time, I was governor of the South African Reserve Bank, and we had been asking the uh, Federal Reserve Bank in the United States to explain to us what exactly was happening in the American housing market, uh, in particular the subprime market. And they'd been telling us about the dynamism of the American economy, uh, flexibility of the American economy, and so on. Meanwhile, a lethal force was gathering. Uh, this collateralized debt obligations, uh, the CDOs, and CDS, what's the S standing for? Uh, whatever it is. CDS and CDOs and CDS squared and so on. Uh, the banks were busy selling uh, among themselves products of things that didn't exist and so on. Until the, 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 the system collapsed. But then it affected all of us throughout the world. So here at home, um, when some of the institutions wanted to in introduce this sort of things, I just pretended to be a real farm boy from Zanina. I said, I don't understand these things. So if I don't understand it, we're not going to introduce it. So first get the farm men from Zanina to understand. Fortunately, I didn't understand until September 2008. Thank God. That's how we escaped part of the financial crisis in the banking sector, but not in the main sector of the, of the economy. So. We have a lot of rebuilding to do, and again, next week we'll talk about some of the things that we think all of us need to do and what the, uh, the government can do uh, together with everybody else. Uh, uh, so the issue of inequality, that this document mentions it three times, this one 45 times. I guess that the next one will be 100 times. Uh, and, and you guys in the ANC sometimes are bad. When you announce something, it doesn't work. You don't come back and tell us that you're no longer pursuing it. You just introduce another thing. So it's Asgisa here. Then everybody thinks Asgisa. Then now NDP. So all of us are NDP. Then radical economic, no, no. Before radical economic transformation, there was a, the developmental state. Developmental state is still. Meanwhile, state capture is happening. Uh, developmental state. Everybody gets caught up in developmental state. Da, 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 da. Uh, that's
of developmental capturing. <laughs> That's what happened. Whilst we're getting caught up in these things, Transnet, ESCOM, webbing all over the place. Then from developmental state, vertical economic transformation, da da da, so on and so forth. So, but when all everybody has said everything else, go back and read Ready to Govern. That is the key ideological basis for ANC point. Everybody tries to rewrite that document of every time. They come back to it every time. So I saw a, um, an aerial picture of uh, some townships and yeah, and next door is a sort of a well-to-do township divided by street. From the air, you see, you see, this side clearly is a sea of poverty. Across the street is better. And someone said, the face of inequality. So we have to pay attention to those, uh, those of you in government. But I agree with you, we need to handle the issue of uh, inequality. We thought in the late 90s that we could handle the issue of inequality via programs of redistribution. programs of redistribution. So, and redi redistribution mustn't just be about social welfare. It must be about also opportunities, entrepreneurship opportunities, education opportunities, uh, and so on. But, yeah, it's a tough one, but we'll try and do whatever we can. Uh, comrades, I have to go back to try and work on this thing that we have to deliver on Wednesday. Comrade Moenji will remain handling the other questions. Uh, as part of his lesson. Uh, thank you very much. Um, comrades, um, we are going to have Comrade Mondi, um responding to some of the other questions. Then the question around that the Sasso comrades asked uh, can we just have the PS come forward to, to respond to that? Thank you very much, comrades. Thank you. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, comrades. Leadership. Uh, I must also take this opportunity to express my appreciation of the inspiring input by Comrade Rasul. And uh, I thought Comrade Tito stopped at a time when I thought I wanted to hear more, the calm and powerful content. Uh, there is one or two or three issues of that I would engage on in the manner I understand them. The issue of land. Probably I might start at the tail where the biggest view is that the land issue is threatening mortgage bonds, threatening financial institutions, and a number of other things. And uh, quietly suggesting that if you proceed with it, it will take country down the tube. But there's another argument that says the fact that this question is not being dealt with 